Good afternoon, everyone. I think um, we will start. I took the uh, it upon myself to introduce Camilo because I'm selfish, and uh, he's a friend and I'm an admirer. So I just said I'm introducing him. So I will um, assume that role. You should all feel free at any moment to get up and and, uh, and have lunch. We're incredibly lucky that Camilo Restrepo is uh, on the East Coast. He's uh, teaching at a, some architecture school to the north of here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, this term begins with age. Um, so he was available to come down and spend Friday uh, with us. Uh, he's going to give a presentation on his work and then Clara and I are going to have a conversation with him. I hope that's an interesting mixture. It seems to me it is. I'm the sort of outsider in this not uh, being a practitioner. Uh, Clara, as you know, is the director of the Latin Lab here. She's an assistant professor of urban planning, so her work comes very much from a planning perspective. Uh, and uh, also, uh, much of her practice and reflections have to deal with issues of, uh, of social equality uh, and social issues which are also, I think, inevitably at the heart of Camilo Restrepo's work. Uh, I, of course, am an architectural historian teaching here in the art history department across the way, uh, but also I'm at the Museum of Modern Art, and many of you might have had the occasion to see the exhibition on Latin American modernism. I promise never to use Latin American as an adjective. Modernist architecture in Latin America, 1955 to 1980, all of that took place probably before Camilo was born, but in any case, um, it uh, I think opened up a lot of questions on a larger scale uh, about uh, this uh, vast region. Camila will tell us, I suppose, in conversation, one of the things I want to talk to him about uh, is whether it is a benefit or a curse to be an architect with a project in architecture, a project in terms of materials, in terms of public space, in terms of reputable models, uh, in terms of climate relations, in terms of a whole series of things that one could read uh, from his growing portfolio of work. Uh, I first discovered it in situ before I knew him with the famous uh, pavilion that was built for the orchids in uh, the park in Medellin. The, I can't even pronounce it, the Orchideorama. <laughs> Uh, in Medellin uh, is perhaps the work that he's best known for, but he has gone on to a whole series <coughs> of, uh, uh, of other works. Uh, look at his website. It is one of the rare websites in architectural practice where you go very, very directly to the project. So uh, you can you can do that. You'll see some of it uh, today. But the the blessing or curse that I refer to is that uh, Camilo Restrepo is inevitably both a participant in, but always classified with that extraordinary transformation uh, in Medellin, in Colombia, which is uh, a city that has managed to completely change its valence in North American news reporting from capital of drug trade and violence and urban dysfunction uh, to, in a period of really under two decades, um, to a, a place that is associated with a laboratory of innovation on the relationship of architecture, right there in the uh, formula, uh, planning, and social uh, reflections. Uh, and so uh, um, that is intertwined with his work in a very, very profound way. Uh, I was rushing to get here not to be involved with the Pope, so I was on the, <laughs> coming from Queens, and I was on the number seven train, and I was thinking, it's amazing. We're going to go talk with Camilo Restrepo about the total transformation in Medellin, and we're also happy because New York City has managed to open the first subway station in 25 years. It's so exciting. Um, so uh, I think we're going to hear a lot about Colombia and Medellin, but I hope also that we can crack and we can keep some of the focus on your extraordinary work as an architect and a pedagogue. So join me in welcoming Camilo Restrepo, and we will figure out what imprecise tropics means. Good, good afternoon. Uh, Barry, thank you very much for the presentation. It's, it's a pleasure to be here today. Clara, thank you very much. And Paul, of course, for bringing me, bringing me here and making really this possible. 
the, um, our interest in architecture has, a, I would say, a complex way of looking at it because for some of the urban related practitioners, we are architects. For the architects, we think about things that has nothing to do with architecture. And for some of the architects as well, uh, our work is con constantly intertwined with some other interests that makes it a little bit hard to, to discuss sometimes for, for some of the people that we share ideas with. Uh, we, we certainly believe that architecture is this intersection where the input most of the times, no matter if it's biogeography, economy, social, handcraft, or, or some of the above here, always the input or the output should be transformed into architectural sources, something that we can grasp as architecture and can be judged from the architectural point of view. Uh, both from the disciplinary point of view and also the practice, but at the same time, the biggest concerns that surround our practice. In this way, we understand architecture as a third order, something that is very ambiguous, something that is not relating or uh, addressing basically projects of objectivity, objectivity or subjectivity, or good or bad, or black and white, and so on. But we believe that this architecture, the architecture, the way we perform it, it's this way of putting all things together in a way that creates a different order that previously didn't exist. So we understand architecture as a way to create transformation, to bring transformation to a place or to think differently in a way we didn't believe it was possible as before. Uh, in precise topics, it's one of the frames that we've been developing in the late years. Um, it, tropical is something that we all relate with uh, this idea of the beach, of the Caribbean. So we believe that one of the ideas that create this imprecision for the topic that we look, that, that we are interested in, is the idea of the mythical, the imagined tropic, perhaps even the cliché. Uh, we think that um, everybody has in mind that, the, that this is the tropic. Uh, a beach with white sand, even a cocktail with a little umbrella in it. Uh, but also the mythical and imagined tropic has gone beyond uh, our time and has this uh, relation with this exotic exuberance of nature. How nature has this kind of domain of, of the real and the imagination when we address the tropic. And at the same time, it's very common that we don't believe, as uh, looking at from outside, that the tropic can be also in the middle of a mountain, as from where we come from. So also the tropic has this sense of uh, the idea of the scientific construction, uh, partly from botanicals, but also at the same time from botanics, but also at the same time from classification, science, all these instruments that allows us to understand nature in a particular way and that transforms through time. Also from some books or some writers that uh, create a frame to understand the tropic or let's say society from a very complex point of view as for example the work of Baba or Sergei Krusinski where a porosity emerges in the moment that there is this conflict between different types of culture, different types of moment, uh, time, like different histories, hi different historical periods overlap at the same time and share the same space. Creating this idea of uh, difference rather than diversity as a way of exchanging and a way of relating and how this takes us in our practice to understand architecture in a very, let's say, practical way, that, that to think through the project, to think through drawings, to think through uh, very precise uh, conditions, but always believing that architecture is the way, or architecture and to design is to design relations in space. And also, the topic of scientific constructions takes us to understand, for example, the idea of the construction of nature uh, taken from Alexander von Humboldt, or the way he is constant, he was constantly uh, mapping many, many different things at the same time. In the way he was putting all the drawings as a way to acquire some knowledge and to define a frame of view, even moving from geology as we saw before. But at the same time, this idea of um, different heights above sea level, which is what creates our climate. Uh, the tropic has very, a very paradoxical condition, and this is when it begins to become very precise, which is that we have no seasons, the weather is almost <coughs> the same all year round, so let's say it's kind, kind of homogeneous, um, but the, micro, the idea of microclimate is very, very important because it's related with geography and the height above sea level. So you can experience in one day different uh, thermical floors or levels 
just by driving from one place to the other one, creating very different conditions, very different uh, climatic situations, and of course, related with that, very different uh, ways of understanding culture. And in that sense, the idea of Sohe as uh, geography, as writing the territory, uh, we understand architecture as well as how architecture writes and marks the territory in a wide sense, taking into account a lot of phenomena and situations and promises and illusions and history and culture, how they come together in a place and that the building becomes this way of interweaving many different times, situations, conditions, etc. And then of course is the topic of experience, the possibility of being there. So where, we come, where I come from in Colombia, geography plays a very big role. For instance, to give you an example, to move from Colombia, from Medellin to Bogota, it's only 300 kilometers. But it takes you more than six hours by car. Because you have to cross a lot of mountains and roads are not very good, I would say. So, so it's it always a long journey, experiencing geography and climate. The experience of being there also, it's uh, the idea of the forest. We are pretty charmed by the idea of the forest because it's an idea of a space that it's either inside, it's either outside, it's an in-between, it's this situation that you cannot tell, that has blurred boundaries, that I will go through that idea a little bit further in, the, in my presentation regarding the forms of transition. But I think it's a form that the idea of a forest pr produces and creates a very interesting figure to understand a way to develop uh, a tropical way of understanding architecture. It can be from, from a, a, a planted a forest or even this wild kind of forest where nature emerges and creates different, creates different veils that is allowing you to have many experiences as you go through. So how movement also and this blurring of the boundaries creates a different sense of, uh, of space. And of course in the topic of experience is this constant clash between uh, neglected areas, uh, the, the power of architecture as a tool for social transformation it has happened in Medellin for the last 10 years, the, um, the way these informal economies are trying to be infrastructure for the first time in many years thanks to these uh, social infrastructures that have been inserted in the last years and how this is taking us also to think and rethink the idea of the rural. What, what are the tools that we have? And that, that's an open question, which is, what are the tools we have to engage with rurality? How do we define rurality today? And what, what's the purpose in engaging in rurality when everybody is thinking about the cities and the future of cities? But what's this codependence, this religion of codependence, this relation of codependency between the urban and the rural? And what's the role as architects that we can provide to, to connect and to establish a different relation between these two conditions. So yes, this, this, this idea of the forms of transition, it's, uh, I, I define it as uh, the architecture of transition is made by the built forms that emerge under extreme geographical, social, and environmental condition. It has indeterminate borders and temporary but intense use. It's not mechanically climatized, it's socially porous. Its space is the result of negotiation processes and exchange between policies for social transformation, communities, and their nearby geography. It is the space in between conditions, technologically mongrel and impure. It emerges from the variations of or exchange between design methods, instruments for knowledge, available resources, and reality. All these frame, of course, without losing the, the track or the line, that anything that would come out from here should address and should uh, try to push the boundary of the discipline and the practice a little bit farther. Not moving into just a social discussion or material discussion or not, not to try to hijack or kidnap the discussion and take it to one territory, but instead of that, opening the, the discussion and providing more tools as, as a way to exchange ideas through the projects, through something that is tangible. In that sense, the, this is the work of an artist from, from Medellin, his name is Camilo Echavarria, uh, and his work, it's interesting because it's, um, he, this is one of his works, it's called Sunset in the Tropic, and uh, when, when you see the image, you even feel somehow the humidity, the temperature, the, all these things being in contrast, in constant uh, change. But when you look at the image, you, you, when you understand his work, you, you see that the image is false, it, it doesn't exist. It's because what he does is that he goes around the tree 
around Colombia or a place that he likes. He takes a lot of pictures and then he creates a new picture out of it, like a kind of a collage. And I think that the way we understand the situations for every project works somehow like the same. We try to cut and select things for that, that brings our mind or that makes sense for us when we, when we are addressing a project. And then we put them all together as a project, reinsert it into reality, and then let reality and the constant use of the space and the situation that gets there be the judge of how the project will, will emerge and will evolve. So this is actually the real uh, Nevado del Tolima, the name of the mountain that I was that it was in the image. This is, the, this is reality, this is real, the, the landscape there. The real landscape is not this. This is another view of that uh, territory. So in that sense, we also have learned <coughs> a lot from, from, the, from all the different... Um, That, that there is also been some instruments that we have learned through these years. And one of them is uh, housing. I think housing is, is very important, it's in, interesting, because it allows you to understand that in many cases, design and architecture, it's about providing availability and potential. With that, I mean that how can we create many different conditions within the same border, within the same space, within the same budget, but how can people adapt the, the space that they are having. In this case, we are, it was a, um, an apartment project made uh, 12 years ago in association with Paul Restrepo, my father, he's also an architect. And here we were setting some units that every user could choose how many windows they will have, where will they have the windows, where will they have the bathrooms, where will they have the um, kitchen, all the, all the different units to the inside we fragmented the program and created some catalogs so people were able to, to, to buy and get his apartment or their apartment according to a structure, a general structure. So understanding in that sense, architecture as an infrastructure that was providing possibilities and opportunities. After that project, we developed another project. We got commissioned another project of housing, uh, very similar to it. But then we expanded the possibilities, so it was not only about what they could do inside, but we also opened the system for other architects to join in. So for this project, it was 50 units of, um, of housing, but then at a certain moment, the way we opened the process, uh, we were more than 38 architects working at the same time. And we were working as an agency, receiving all the designs from other architects that the clients had uh, brought into the project, and we were coordinating all that information creating a very personalized layer for each one of the apartments, but with all of the designs that the other architects that were hired were producing. So all of these uh, balconies that you see there, they could choose how many balconies they had, if it was long, if it was short, if they could add a, a balcony two years after being built or before they were building it. So now when you look at that image, or you see an image from five years ago, you will see that the balconies have changed constantly because every, every time somebody moves in, uh, a balcony gets dismantled or, some, or another one gets added. So it creates this dynamic constantly, but provided by the tools that design can, can give. So then also another thing that uh, we learned a lot about was uh, when we did the Orchidiorama, uh, which is a pavilion for flower exhibition in Medellin in association with also with my father and Plan B Architects. Uh, so we were commissioned to do a, a, a small building, 3,000 square meters, for the exhibition of flowers, which is the, um, it, it belongs to the, to the local cultural fair. We have a fair every year that is called the, pa the Party of Flowers or the Fair of Flowers. And then they use this space to exhibit these flowers. So, but the question what for us from an architectural point of view was, how we were able to create a building without boundaries in a way that we only could have this experience from the forest derived from this in-between space, no inside, no outside, just the canopy, extending the quality of uh, temperature and atmosphere that was already in the forest around in the botanic garden, but then creating this um, multiple activity inside of it. This is what used to be the old Orchidiorama, this used to be 
uh, a very a gated street with walls and very dangerous, I would say. But with the with the Mayor Fajardo, then the first investments to transform the city came here to the Botanic Garden. So also we were thinking that how the, the Botanic Garden, our proposal, could operate in a very ambiguous way by not only being uh, a park inside a park, but also being like a park connecting the city and the border between a social frontier that was there always. So how this park or this uh, space was like a cover plaza available constantly every day of the week uh, now everybody uses for uses for weddings, um, parties. Uh, people just go there and play music. Or it has become a, a very strong and dynamic public space. So this was somehow the the site. Uh, this was the this frontier I was telling you, the frontier between the let's say the traditional city center and the informal settlements. So this is where the botanic garden plays this role, articulating this uh, covered public space. And, and as you can see here in this video made by Cristóbal Palma, the Chilean photographer, you, you see the diversity of activities that take place and how, how we wanted also to make match the, um, the climatic change with the time, the, 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 the climatic time with the time of use. How people go there and enjoy it, no matter the time of the year, the day, the hour, so it become very, very, a very dynamic public space. The building it's um, made by steel structure covered with pine wood, uh, coming from a sustainable crop nearby. Uh, the the roof it's um, polycarbonate, and the other ones are uh, a metallic tile. So we structure the project by an element that we call the flower tree, which is this. So it's a hexagon with its hexagons as as roof as well. The one in the middle works like a little courtyard. It's covered with wood, as I tell you, and each one of them has a kind of a guard, has a garden, each one of them. So we wanted this to be 14 of these units, but for budgetary reasons and for time and for, and also because we learned that the trees around were already so big and they wanted to keep it, we moved instead of having 14 to 10. And that was an interesting point because we were also trying to see if with one unit we could we were able to give response to all these conditions that were taken into that competition into into the competition and the needs. I will move uh, forward. So so somehow what, what what explains the best is the section where we only had this horizontal line creating the, the canopy or the roof and how the, the perspective of the trees and, and the atmosphere of this in between space was tangible. So then in year 2012, Fajardo becomes the governor of the department, like, like the state, and he opens this competition for the educational parks. Uh, mine is located in Briseño, it's a very tiny town, I will go on, I will explain it further. So the problem is that for our society, we have very strong problems related with violence, inequality, illegality, and of course, all this pumped by the drug, by the drug business. So, the question was how to address rurality with uh, social infrastructures that will provide opportunities for peasants and yeah, for peasants outside of the main city, uh, outside of Medellin, without these people needing to move to the city and leaving the rural areas unattended. But at the same time, how they could engage with contemporary conditions of education, a welfare state. A entrepreneurial and so on. So this is Briseño, it's here, it's around here, it's 150 kilometers from Medellin. The first 120 kilometers take you two hours, the last 30 kilometers take you three hours. The, the road is very narrow, this is the, um, the town, it's, this town has only 2,000 inhabitants, and this is somehow what has happened with Briseño. Briseño is a place in the middle of the Colombian conflict. These are some headlines from the newspaper for the last three years. And this one is something like, uh, the guerrilla attacks a uh, police station in Briseño. Uh, snipers uh, hit the troops in Antioquia, the department, but in Briseño. Uh, the energy returns to Briseño after five days. They blew the electrical towers. 
Um, but now, with the peace process going on, the first um, investment that is going on to remove the landmines are happening exactly in Briseño as well. So this entitles us, in a way, and poses some questions that how do we engage rurality in a post-conflict situation as Colombia is facing right now? But also, how, what are the tools we have from an architectural point of view, and how do we think when supplies are really, really hard to get there? For example, all the glasses, all the windows, sorry, all the windows got broke twice because of the road. So, how, how, the question for us was at that moment, not only how to build it, but how to maintain it. So the, the, the answer in a way was kind of um, strange for the context, but, but it was very interesting to see how people, how the inhabitants received the project very proudly, saying that it was the first time they got a project that had architecture as in the world. Not because all, most of the times the government has provided all these little towns very rough, let's say, un on thought architecture, something that becomes more like a brick structure and that's it. So what we were doing was, we, we got a very, very narrow lot, a only 20 by 10. We couldn't have a staircase and ramp or elevator or stuff to provide um, mobility for handicaps. So we chose only to have a ramp that will provide all the circulation around the, the building. This was an emergency staircase that in the end was not built. So it's a system that goes around, and for, the, for each of the floors, there is a program. The program is a gallery for cultural identity, a, a room for entrepreneurial and education, a education through distance with the state university, and a room for teachers and professors to learn a, new devices or new methodologies for education, because that's what they want to tackle the most. It connected everything with, um, with, with Medellin and the State University. So, so this was pretty much the, the section of it, a uh, constant ramp going on. Uh, this, is, this was the site just behind the, the municipality and the, and the church. So this is, this is what, what we did. We chose a material, a metallic tile from Hunter Douglas that we could create an alphanumeric way of understanding it, A, B, C, one, two, three. So nobody, no matter who was there, could put it in. Uh, the construction inside is just as brick as you see it, but painted with white. Very simple finishes in the, in the interior. But then it has become a very important um, center for the culture of the, of, of the, of the little town. I couldn't visit the site often to supervise the construction for security reasons. So we were doing everything through email or mobile phone because we were not allowed to go there for a, for a long time. And the space works like different layering. You have, you have different layers from the outside to the inside to provide a thermodynamic uh, condition instead of having air conditioner or climatized uh, systems. So now they are teaching their ways of understanding coffee production and so, uh, milk and some of the products that are in the region. And th this, this last project that I'm showing you, it's a coffee benefit. It's a building where coffee gets uh, <coughs> produced before being uh, roasted. So the, the question, I, I, here I have to go leap a little bit away from from architecture in order to be able to explain what's the logic behind the coffee business. Uh, so one kilo of, um, of coffee, of grounded coffee, produces 50 espressos. But to have one kilo of roasted coffee, you need nine kilograms of cherries, of coffee cherries, which is this. When you pay for one espresso, it's around two dollars, something like two or three dollars. But when you pay for 160, sorry, when you pay for 50 espressos, you're talking about a 60, 70,000, 70 dollars Colombian price. You will see what this creates because when they, when they make, uh, when, when you plant coffee, the rate between what's being planted and what's being paid for it, it's a big, big gap in the income of the coffee growers. 
So you see that one, one kilo of, um, five kilos of cherries, as I was telling you, it's one kilo of, um, of roasted coffee. But the difference in the price is that five kilos of the cherry is not even a dollar. So the, all the effort that a coffee grower has to make to have a good price for the coffee, it's very, it's very, it, it's very tough because most of the coffee gets negotiated in the New York Stock Exchange as the rate is more or less 125 the pound. But when you look at the different types of coffee that you can see, a roasted coffee or, or the one that you put with water and just um, a soluble cup, I don't know how you call it, um, yeah, instant coffee. When, when you see that, only 170 grams are like three or four dollars in Colombia, but the cherries, five kilos of cherries are not even a dollar. So there is a big gap in the income for the coffee growers. And this is somehow the process of the coffee. Is the cherry, then it gets uh, washed and clean, and then you got this without, before getting this peel out. Then it becomes green coffee. This is the one that is created in New York. And then here it moves to roasted coffee. So in this case, uh, we, were, we got a commission from a cooperative and the biggest coffee buyer in Colombia to design a, where, a kind of a warehouse where they could get more money for the coffee by, by, the, by the processes and by the, some stimulus that they would get economically. The question also was, for example, for a traditional family, uh, the average of the traditional family is 55 years old, the coffee, the, the leader of the family. Usually they have two or three kids. The kids don't want to be coffee growers anymore. If that tendency keeps on going on, they expect that in 20 years there will be no Colombian coffee because there is no one there to pick up the harvest. So, and the time, since the income is so small, it's only 400, uh, sorry, it's only $3,000 a year only for picking up the coffee. The average of the farm of a traditional coffee grower is two hectares, 0.7. So with $3,000 a year, the income is not enough for them. So they have to have another work or another job in another farm. So this is somehow the timetable for, the, for a day of them. They work from four in the morning to eight in the morning in their farm, producing their coffee. They have to go from eight in the morning to six in the afternoon to pick up or take care of someone else's coffee, then return at six and go to bed at 10 or 11 because they're taking care of their farm. For the wife, it's almost the same work. And for the kids, it's pretty much the same. The highest school desertion happens when there is coffee harvest because since they don't need, the, since they don't have a labor to pick it up or they are working for another farm, kids have to take care of the, of the, of the harvest and the coffee production. So these things that become, um, that, that are quite simple as we believe that we are just drinking a beverage, it has a very strong uh, impact in social relations and in the families of the, um, of the rural areas. So what we're trying to do with this is try to bring more possibilities through a building and some programs around the building that will provide these farmers more time, that will provide the farmers also more possibilities with the um, stepping out of uh, having, I mean, trying to have more uh, opportunities for the coffee growers that in the future they will be growing coffee and will be there. And instead of moving from these um, pyramids, this is the um, demographic pyramid of this area, the coffee growers, you see that coffee growers are here, the young people is in this uh, level, but they want to move there to the city because here is where they find the opportunities. They don't have any opportunities there. And this is somehow the, the pyramid that's been um, trying to be, the problem, the problem that's been tackled across uh, the, the state with the idea of the educational parks. So, so what, what we want to do with this is try to guarantee that these people somehow in a, in a higher percentage, not all of them, that would be impossible, will remain and have the same possibilities attached to the system of production. So in these trips of coming back and forth to, to this site where, the, where this project is, I will tell you in a while where it is and some more details, 
we realized that it was important to design something that we could give value to this beverage, but also to the culture. So we got, we paired with La Bestial Ceramica in some friends, and thinking about the idea of Humboldt, of the tropical, of the different levels, above sea level, and the production that comes out of it, and each one of the beverages that are traditional from these sites, we came with the idea of creating a, a, a recipient, a cup, that we could pair with a social uh, NGO or a company to uh, sell these. So it will be that the big ones are good for for what we call agua de panel, which is a sugar cane peel, like this size, a smash with lemon and water. It's a traditional beverage. One for coffee and one for aguardiente, which is like a spiritus uh, beverage. So what we're trying is that we're negotiating with a, with an NGO, a local NGO, to sell these cups through supermarkets, and the benefit of this will be invested in, in producing educational opportunities for the, for the coffee growers in that region. It, it's already been produced, this is some of the, of, of the elements we use for the design and the, and the process, and this is pretty much it. So returning to the, um, to the situation of the coffee growers, um, the, the coffee growing uh, process is that the coffee gets um, pulled out of the tree, then it goes to a turning machine that takes off the peel, then the grain goes into the water, gets there fermented for 8 to 16 hours, it depends on the coffee grain. The water gets out extremely polluted, that's something that is not well known, but the coffee industry is a very high contaminant because when the water goes out, it has high levels of, it demands oxygen in high levels. So what we are doing is we are taking the water to bioremediation gardens. Then these uh, grains go into a big machine where they are dried uh, by hot pump air being, yeah, pump, pump in. And then it gets peeled in another place, but the, but the little peel that comes out, we are using it to feed, again, the system to heat, to, pro to provide heat. <coughs> So this is somehow, somehow the, the process. The, the red cherry, the cherry being uh, washed, then it gets, this gets taken away, it's fermented in water, dried in the sun or through machines as we are going to do it, and then it's ready to take the, this thing away, the, a kind of parchment, and then um, it's ready to become an export. So what, we're, what, what we found also is that this these uh, regions have very strong history as architecture history derived from, from arts and crafts, from people from the late 19th century. What they were doing was carving wood and, create, and creating some elements out of iron and metal mechanical work. Uh, very bright with colors, very clear structures of how to contain the, the roof, how to provide this layering of balconies, structure, how to provide air to let the air go through. And very traditional architecture became also at the same time these kind of icons of uh, craftsmanship that, that, were, that were developed for many, for many years in, in these regions. So we thought that at the same time that we could look at this information, try to recover it and reinsert it into the system that it's getting lost, and how, how to give value to, to a story or a history in this case to a history that not even the, in this process of urbanization of these rural areas, how to give value to history and the material uh, icons or the material elements in a from a different perspective. At least how to put value to something that for them uh, just, um, it, it's like landscape for them. I mean, they don't, they don't give the value to it. But some identities, identities have been built on top of these uh, forms and logics. So the question was also how to create this echo with these um, traditional materials, colors, and landscape, and how to put all these together in a way that the that just a, what, what was supposed to be just a warehouse could could have been more than just a warehouse. So what we did was that we we put all this in a very simple uh, floor plan. This is Ciudad Bolivar, 76 kilometers from from Medellin, <clears throat> and we took all these ingredients from the um, elements from the traditional lands coffee landscape and put it in. This is the lot, the site of the, 
of the of this production of this warehouse. And what we did was that we anyway gave the answer to the production situation, but then we convinced our clients that we needed there a kind of a cultural, small cultural center, a community center, where they will have many different conditions and many different educational programs that will be open every year, every day, every month, in order that when the coffee growers that can go there just only with a bag of coffee or a truck could remain there, have education, have birth control, have other kinds of um, feedback and education for them to remain there. Also connectivity, Wi-Fi connectivity and computers. That's something that in these faraway towns uh, is, not, is not easy to find. And also a laboratory to analyze and provide the coffee growers of data of what's the coffee that they are receiving. Uh, also an analysis for soil how this uh, soil is behaving according to the harvest or the, or the time. Sorry, if some of you want to sit here, there are some seats available. It's four here, eh? and I see many of you are standing. So this is, this is somehow the section. The section begins to create also some spaces provided by, that will provide shade when they have to create a long wait when the harvest arrives. Uh, the machines are super high machines, uh, just a, a normal concrete slab to attend this, and um, the volcanic, uh, sorry, the, 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 the community center that is available no matter the day or the time of the, of the year. So at the same time, we had here uh, a small location, a small space to process all the cherries that are, uh, that, that becomes garbage after the process to be mixed and create either a tea that you can that you can consume, they dry it in the sun and it's a tea uh, in soluble water, in hot water, or uh, they can also make it become compost. So the section, what we were trying to do also was insert some air because it produces 45,000 liters of water damp inside. So we, we wanted to create some air to come in, a very basic thermodynamic situation to, to inject uh, cold air to make the hot air go up and and evacuate in the upper part, keep the idea of these very big structures that are read as simple but very clear um, entities of architecture. A column is a column, a beam is a beam, the wall is the wall. No ambiguity in the elements in, in, uh, until, um, up to a certain point. And also, how to keep the color of this um, identity of these infrastructures that have been around for many years. So what we did was, to solve, to solve this, we created some panels of prefab concrete, uh, creating three different layers. The base, the base, um, a, a kind of an abstraction of these elements of carving the wood. The one in the middle, it's a texture of, um, you know, the, the the bags where the coffee is. What's the name of that textile? Um, so, Verla. Yeah. So all the concrete. Here it's made on a burlap uh, mold, so all the texture will be printed in it. And in the <laughs> upper part, it's uh, with holes and with some uh, high, uh, the, the volume will come out um, and will provide a different amount of holes that, we cal that, that, that it's calculated to provide air and constant uh, flow of air. So it's pretty much this, these three layers that enclose the, the, the wall, that, that encloses the, the building. Some of the elements that we created. The, the project has been, it's under construction right now. It will be finished at the end of the year. These are the, the elements of the upper part. The, the model, some of the images, it's, this is the scale. It's, it's quite big, it's 60 by 38. And in a way, this is interesting because also the, the community get, got involved, but uh, in a way that they were providing feedback once we had a project. It was, it, was, it was more a conversation that the cooperative had with the coffee growers, and they have very high expectations because this will attend more than 650 families of that region. Uh, 650 families pollute more than 20 million liters of water every year if they do the benefit on their own. By this, some of these benefits will need to be turned down. 
So they will have more time, they will only have to deliver the coffee and then the process will, be, will happen inside instead of them having to deal with the, all the process all year round, all time and having the children to leave uh, school to attend this, this process. So we chose this terracotta color from concrete, um, a pre prefab concrete. These are some of the samples that we've been doing now for three or four months. These are some of the um, molds. And this is what is beginning to, to emerge. Also these ones. It's a, uh, 160 by, oh, so, sorry, one, yeah, 160 but one, by 120 uh, units, like tiles. And this is pretty much what, what it will be look like in the coming, the next three or four months. That's it, thank you very much. sensibility that this work shows and the fact that you also select to talk about it as a collective production. He said, we did this, we thought that, we are in the process of creating this, etc. and the firm itself is uh, called Agenda, as opposed to Camilo Restrepo. I wanted to notice that particularly for this audience of architecture because any architectural work is a collective work and it is very important to recognize that you as a single creator can indeed have a phenomenal leadership granted to the project but it is important to acknowledge everybody that is contributed to those works. So thank you for that. I also wanted to have some comments with relationship to the importance of serving in a rural context. We all have heard I think, from the United Nations and other sources that we now live in a world that is mostly urbanized. More than 50% of the population is urbanized and we're becoming ever more urban. Latin America is, by the way, the region of the world that is the most urbanized. Colombia is not at the top, uh, but it is fairly urbanized, so why, why to consider so much attention for the rural context? Well, the fact that we are 50% urbanized now means that we are almost 50% rural yet. So we cannot discard attention to this population that continues to be enormous and very important because they are actually the ones that are in charge of providing every, everybody food and other resources, right? So attention to that matter is important in those terms, uh, but it is also in the context of Colombia because as Camilo was explaining, uh, they have suffered for more than uh, half a century a civil war that is promoting still today a very accentuated rural to urban migration. So we need those types of supports that programs of the kind of the project that uh, Camilo showed would have in order to support rural economies, rural entrepreneurial activities, training for such rural activities. And I think that there's a lot to celebrate in this work that we, we saw, not only in the use of materiality, the sensibility in the spatial conditions that are created with it, but most particularly because of the programs that they have that work as some sort of a acupuncture work that can really vibrate and, 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 and produce a multiplying effect that would support for some people to have the opportunity to remain rural and or to inhabit as they choose and want that space that is becoming ever more ambiguous between the rural and the urban. 
space for which we actually do not have even proper language for. I have heard people talk about the rural-urban space. People talk about the transit. It's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tool, it's a framework well known in the design world, right? All, all the scalability between the very natural terrain to the, the super urbanized terrain such as the one that we have in Manhattan and everything in between, how they are composed together, imbricated with each other, defining them together, each other. So I wanted to ask uh, perhaps Camilo, if you have the opportunity to comment to us, the, the concept of the tropics that you claim as very ambiguous, and I was thinking of concepts that we learn from anthropology that I think that we should explore more in the areas of design, architecture, urban design, urban planning. The concept of in between, the concept of the state of long, uh, be, becoming as opposed, to, as opposed to the state of being, the concept of the liminal, and the one that I'm exploring myself in my work related to Latin America, the concept of the transbordering. The fact that we have multiple borders that we traverse all the time, not only the spatial, the physical borders and the national borders, but we have cultural borders, we have social borders uh, that, we also, we, that we also need to take into account when we design, when we uh, plan for our rural and urban areas. Uh, so how, how can you have that conversation perhaps with uh, anthropology along those lines for the definition of, the, of those borders? And for other of the concepts that you have, how could you also learn from other disciplines? For example, when you talked about the third order, I conceived of the concept put out by Baba and Edward Soja about the third space. There is, there is this genealogy that perhaps can be recognized for it there. And when you talked about three different types of tropics, the intellectual or the scientific one, the experiential one, and the imagined one, it prompted in me those notions offered by Henry Lefebvre. Three types of space, the imagined space, following also Pierre Bourdieu's proposition of that notion, the experienced space and the perceived space. So I'm wondering if incorporating the genealogy of those concepts can allow also for, for a richer texture to them and a greater uh, implication for the notion of ambiguity that you are trying to work very successfully with. I'll stop there. The room is such that actually us coming over here is a little weird. I think we, 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 we can actually come closer to the center. We can take those three stools. Oh, that's it. Yeah, perfect. Okay. 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 I'm trying to compete with you as a spatial interventionist. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Clara. Um, I think that the topic, it's, um, it's complex because I, I think that so far none of the people or most, or just a few of us that, that have lived and grown in the tropic have, have been able to determine a certain mind frame to understand the topic. When, when you see the, in, in, what I think is that when you see the best um, way of describing the topic has always come from the outside. It's always a notion of somebody being able to get outside and look at it. By, by that, I mean that while you are on the topic, everything seems so homogenous in a way. The, 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 the time, for example, uh, October the 4th, 8 in the morning, or March the 5th, 8 in the morning, is exactly the same. Time doesn't go by or doesn't relate with uh, seasons. Uh, either with temperature. So when you find this homogeneity, this homogeneity as an experience, but this diversity as, uh, as land, as geography, as microclimate, as social uh, constant uh, change, 
you see that most of the tools or many of the tools that you learn through architecture schools or through uh, thinkers or books or they, they don't apply in the same way there. They always work in a very ambiguous way, in a way that for some things it will work, but for some others don't. It's, it's not a, as easy, for example, as I guess, I mean, in, if they say in Sweden that in the year 2025, on October the 4th, they will open uh, this or that building, they will open it. I mean, it's, it's really that they will do it. Uh, in the tropic, it's not like that. Uh, it, they say that they will open it, perhaps it will never happen. So you need to deal, to deal with this uncertainty that is constantly there. So the question is for us, it's more like a question than an answer still, is what are the tools that provides us to answer to these types of uncertainty? And how we can turn these operations that at a certain moment we're heading one way, we can turn it the other way but use the same resources or the same elements in order to keep on with the discussion or tackling the problem, but at the same time being able to react very quick. In, in that sense, it's it, it, to give you very simple uh, examples. Um, for example, the, the, the botanic garden. At a certain moment, we had 14 of these elements. But before, I mean, it was only six months of, uh, of construction. And then they said, OK, it's not going to be 10. It's, gonna be, it's not going to be 14. It's going to be 10. And you need to rethink how the sun is coming, because uh, we just realized, I mean, six months after that, we just realized that if the orchids get direct sun from in this part, it will be burned out completely. So you need to find a way to attack the problem. So is this um, requirement that design has this uh, ab ability, ability to perform constantly, but you need to have also these tools working not only as a, as a response, as an, as an answer, but at the same time, I think we are entitled and we need to create a theory of practice of our own. Because many of the frames that come from Europe or the US or, or some other places, are, you, you cannot apply it because the logic is so different. But we, I feel that we can also belong to that history of architecture when we understand it and we perform from different perspectives. And, and I think that's what we try to do with the projects. I would love, as one of my heroes is Alexander von Humboldt, so of course I am fascinated by the way you move from the diagram of the natural condition and understanding how complex even the brilliant Humboldtian analysis of topographical section in relationship to geology, botany, climate, etc. And then you have transformed in the course of this presentation that into, with your cups, <laughs> the social. Uh, and the social relationship to the territorial. Uh, if I were in Scaremore Hall, in my, my historian's hat, I would want to, I'd want to talk about that in relationship to Humboldt and his uh, actuality, but that might appear a little bit arcane, what I, because Humboldt also wrote really brilliant treatises on political situations, political organization, notably in relationship to Mexico. But I want to get very concrete because the room is filled with people who are training to go out in the world uh, and, and operate. And very detailed your analysis of production, social production, and uh, architecture in relationship to a very remote place. But one that's not really remote because it's at the center of this conflict, which is uh, you know, at least a hemispherical wide operation. Uh, so we're all very, uh, New York City is very implicated in that little town. Um, but the one thing, I, unless I wasn't paying full attention, that I didn't hear and would be really interesting, I think, for all of us to know, is from now, from your experience, what is the relationship of the kind of activist architect you are and the political situation? And what is and what can be that, that relationship? Because so much of what you talk about is, uh, is, is programmatic, or anything. how we can rethink quality production, how we can, how we can uh, intervene in such a way that we can deal with what Claire was saying is the need really not to be an agent of urbanization but a, a, but an agent that is in a kind of Patrick Geddes way the transactional uh, thing so you, you followed Fajardo actually in a certain way from the, from the metropolis of Medellin to the whole state uh, just if you could talk
talk to us a bit about that relationship between architects and architecture and politics and help us know what would be relevant for anyone uh, and what is specific to being able to follow an extraordinary figure like Fajardo? Yes. No, it's a, it's a very good question. I, I think Fajardo has a very important, uh, I'm quoting him, and he says that the most important decisions for society are taken by politicians, whether we like it or not. It's, it's nothing we can do about it. it. All the best decisions or the, the decisions that matter for society are taken by politicians. So in that way, uh, the, the appearance of Fajardo in the political spectrum of Colombia is very rare. It's not, it's not common. But since he did it, and me and some other friends, we have uh, constant discussions about architectures, the city, politics, and, and some other topics. We, we've been involved with many different groups uh, of m many different kinds. Some of them are politicians running to be mayors or governors or city council or, 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 or others. Uh, some others are that uh, corporate uh, CEOs and some others are community leaders. What, what I'm trying to say is that we need to make ourselves necessary for society as architects. That means that we need to talk with everybody. We tend to think that we, when we only talk to ourselves as architects or to our clients, we are pushing the boundaries forward. But that's not completely true, either completely false. But what I'm trying to, my point is that how we make ourselves necessary for society and for the discipline. When we are able to listen and exchange ideas with all these groups at the same time, that we become this intersection for the project and for the process, and we make that the project is the point where everybody meets, I think we have a lot of possibilities. When we detach from that, if somebody's taking decisions for us, and then we make ourselves a little bit irrelevant. By that, I mean that they can fire us very easy. I mean, we, we, they can just say, we, we don't need you because you're not adding anything to the value of being an architect. Design as design, as plain thought, I think anybody can do it. That's not that difficult to design just as design. But the question is how you are able to open your, let's say, your window to let most of all the things that you go by into it. As if you could put the landscape while, while driving a car, if you could pick up the landscape out of the window and bring it to the car. That's somehow what, what we do. We try to make it that every project, we bring many different agents back into it. When we got the commission of the, of the coffee warehouse, for them, they said, OK, we want a nice design. That's what they required from us. They wanted a, a beautiful facade. That's the only thing they wanted. But then we, when we began to go there and understand how the coffee business works and going there many times on listening from coffee growers from the cooperative, we understood that it needed an extra program to complement what was going on. Because for a coffee grower, this is one of the paradox. For all the coffee growers, most of them, the peasants, they don't even know how the coffee they produce, it tastes. They don't know the taste of the coffee. When you go there, they offer you instant coffee. They've never tried their coffee. So how can we shorten the distance between, or make transparent the relation between what they produce, what they are, and the economy they are pumping? So I think that, that, that I don't know if that answers the question, but it, the question in the end is how we make ourselves necessary by understanding the networks that happen to coincide on a project and how you bring it in. Also, but always uh, in architectural code, that, that you can explain it and classify it, discuss it from the point of view of architecture. I think that what you're describing here relates very well to another notion that you introduced in your talk when you said about the role of the architect uh, uh, being that of a collage maker. You were referring to spatial collage, and I think that the project of that building in Medellin in which the users can select the layout and, and pop up balconies as they wish is fabulous, not only from, a, from a, a spatial point of view as a collage, but also from a temporal point of view, because you can do it in time. You can come and with time and with better means, then pop up your balcony and do it one way or another in time. In that manner, not only the designer is producing a collage as a toolkit of components to pick and choose from, but the user is also partaking in that collage making. 
And the way you're describing the acting of an architect is also related to the collage idea or to the bricoleur idea, but also uniting concepts that come from the dimensions of the, of the political, the social, the cultural, and the spatial aspects of each particular project. Yes, I, I think that we, we try to bring as many agents as possible and make that the project is that common platform where things emerge or things get together, no matter the budget, no matter the location. For example, I, I never expected to work in the rural areas <coughs> 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we were focused on the city, on Medellin, the urban <coughs> realm. But now, we've been forced, for very good reasons, to think about something that seemed, at that moment seemed to be the countryside, but nothing more than that. I mean, something that happened outside of the city, a very blurred in, in its constitution and its, and its uh, operation. But now we're forced to work there because it's an um, it's, uh, intersection of political, social, economical, ecological reasons that, that requires a service from architecture. Well, I mean, it, it, it is a complete urgency how to deal with the flow of people in, uh, in the city. So it does. That's what's so fascinating about it. As isolated as that place is, as hard as it is to get to, it's actually completely interconnected with the uh, absolute largest problem. So thinking, thinking about the informal settlement in the, in the urban situation and thinking about this remote village are intimately related. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, they, and so I think one could maybe ask the, the question. There has been such an explosion of interest in the favela <coughs> settlement in its growing megalopolis situation. Uh, it's not the, the world is to go back to some nostalgic picturesque is actually uh, uh, a part of the holistic way of thinking of this. And it could actually be a very productive time to tackle these challenges in the urban uh, areas of Antioquia, the region, because that mayor that was the leader in the production of what we call the urban miracle of Medellin is now the governor of that region. So uh, and he has enormous plans also for the region, one of which is this one in which the cultural center is uh, framed because Antioquia, la más educada, the most educated region, is the, perhaps the flag program for Sergio Fajardo as governor. So there is perhaps a lot of opportunity to grow along those lines of your projects. And, and that would be one question. How do you figure your projects or the concepts behind them scaling up if they, if they should need to do so? And, and in what way would they scale up? Just the principles in the abstract or, or some aspects of their speciality as well? I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I don't know because it, though the more you go into the rural, the projects will scale down even more. I mean, scale down in size and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, especially the, the role of e e economy and maintenance will play a, an amount, a, a very big role there because some of these parts are so remote and so far away and the budget for these little towns is so, so small that, I don't know, you, you, we will have to rethink how we build and how we put materials together and, what, and, and at the same time provide a contemporary answer with architecture. That, that it was, for example, one of the discussions around my project because some of the other educational parks, there are, there are 79, more of them, uh, mine was in a constant discussion because for the people from the governance, from the governor's office, they were saying that my project was an alien for the for, for the community, and in part it is. But 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 the um, but but the point was not only how to respond with contemporary architecture, but what was the role of architectural elements and history in these places that for many years got completely destroyed because they wanted to the, the population in many of these places just destroy it because they got money out of a drug dealing or or illegal businesses. So what, what, what was the role of an architecture that would come there and even discuss ideas of identity? Because what happened when, when all these towns wanting to be more 
modern and more contemporary, they tear down all their patrimony. Uh, they tear down all the all, all, all these handcrafts that I was showing you for windows and everything. In many cases, they just got rid of it because they wanted to be modern. So what was the question about how, how history plays a role there? Even the questions of identity rise again. What, what's the identity when some of the decisions of a hyper-local place as this town are taken globally here in the Stock Exchange of New York? So how does that happen and how can architecture react to those things? Try not to see it as protecting something necessarily, but what's the role and what can we say about it from the point of view of architecture? And what are the, what, what are the logics that we create, perhaps from a Aldo Rossi point of view of architecture of the city? What's the role of the building in that city or in that little town? How we provide a structure and a readability to it? But at the same time, what's the point of view from the peasant point of view of what, are, what is the city they are looking at? And what's the city they are wishing to have? So that creates a, an important uh, question and dilemma that I think we need to sort it out in the coming years. I would also want to ask, if I may, how do you situate that uh, contextuality that your project has in the, in the trajectory, the historical trajectory of the city itself and its architecture and its urban design? Because here in the school, we have had the visits of Alejandro Echeverri that uh, brought up the notion of social urbanism in Masanti, yeah. that was the one that designed the Spain library on top of the Santo Domingo barrio that, it, that has become so iconic because it's bringing that quality architecture to the favela, to the barrio. And in your case, your, your cultural center is doing that too. So how, how do you read that relationship? I think that in many cases, we, from the urban perspective, we have so many prejudice and so many patronizing uh, ideas towards the rural. For example, one of the leaders of the governor's office regarding the educational part, she was saying to me, like, oh, your project has nothing to do with the context. Uh, they, what they want is something that looks like what they already have. And it was very strange because what they already had, they turned down to, to have this very weird town. Uh, when, when, when I saw that that was in danger, I mean the materials and everything that we were thinking to create a kind of a different center for the little town, the, the only thing that came to my mind was bring the materials to the community and explain why I wanted to put that and what was the reason for maintenance and so on. And something that struck me a lot was that, that, that uh, one of these guys, the, the mayor in fact, uh, he came to me and said, you know, we are very proud to have a building as you are proposing it because it's the first time in all our history that we have a building that belongs to the world, not to, not to what we had or not to what we are doing right now. This seems to be like a building that we can have in the US or Europe or something. And it's a guy that almost can't even read. I mean, the guy got into Jekyll two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. For, for, for some, he, he provided with energy and electric, electrical power. He benefited somebody from the town with an electrical connection that he was not allowed to do, of course. Should we open up the question? Yes. I am asking to because the only way I can get where I need to go with the public in town is one single train. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to say thank you personally. I mean, that would follow up, but yes. I think there's too much of interest here to allow my schedule to interrupt the question. Thank you very much. Yes, let's open it up for comments and questions, please. <laughs> yes. So you could introduce yourself. Oh, yes. I am Navila Morales, and uh, I come from Puerto Rico. And I became very interested in what you were discussing of, you know, the climate of the tropics, like the tropics of the tropics, the Caribbean. And so how you were saying that it's hard to do things in the tropics and that how it's ambiguous, it's imprecise, and that, as you were saying, like, you take, for example, Sweden, or you take, like, somewhere in the United States, and things actually get done, but in the tropics they do not. That how is it because of this homogeneous climate, or I don't know what it is. But it's the same things I've been questioning myself. Once coming into New York, it's becoming more clear that difference of lifestyles in the tropics and somewhere that is not the tropics. 
and as you say, once you take that distance, it's how you will be able to see it. And then also when I go visit back to Puerto Rico, it yeah. becomes even more clear when comparing to New York, those differences. Yeah. And then I was, my question, and maybe I don't know the answer, I don't expect to have an answer, but <laughs> like, is it really because of the climate or is there something there that's also the, the complejo del colonizado? I don't know how to say it in, mm -hmm. in English. Like how Colonial has, mentality. Yes, how does that maybe have to do more with the fact that in the tropics everything, nothing gets done? Because for example, Puerto Rico, maybe it's a bit clear because we're still a colony in a way. Um, that when you're studying in school, you study how to do architecture for the tropics, but then at the same time you have to learn how to do architecture for the United States because we have to take the tests that are that the United States gives us even though we don't have to design ever like that. So it's like, but then there's also the mentality of this aesthetic that we want to pursue that is European or American, and then you build a building that is very mechanical in the tropics and then it doesn't work, but it's also that, you know, trying to aspire to be either from the United States or European maybe has to do more with that and complete the colonial or the tropics or what, what is your opinion on that? I think that we are... There is a, one thing that makes it very complicated, it's geography, of course, and topography, and especially geology. Because to provide infrastructure in the Andes Mountains, the conditions of the Andes is not as solid as, for example, Switzerland is. Switzerland and most of Latin, yeah, exactly. Or Switzerland, or, or what, I'm, what I'm saying is that Switzerland and Latin America, in the mount, in the conception of mountain and geography, is very similar. Of course, economy is completely different, but but that part of Europe, for example, doesn't have any earthquakes. So you, when you begin to add layers of complexity, you see that you have, you don't have the same budget. It, Geology is complicated, earthquakes are complicated. So what, ha what begins to happen is that you, you begin to find many countries that are regions of very particular cultures that are not connected at all. When, when I mention that from Medellin to Bogotá it's only 300 kilometers, I'm not only mentioning that if the, how difficult it is to go from one point to the other one, but at the same time, you see that the cultures in Bogotá and Medellin are absolutely different, as if it was two countries. And and that creates more problems because when you want to create a governance of that, the tools that have, that have been provided to provide governance, uh, education, or even the idea of society, it's much more complicated. Some countries in Latin America solve it easier. I, I will say that perhaps also because of the topography they solve it easier. For example, uh, I will take the risk and say that Chile made it different, uh, Brazil made it different. But in the case of Colombia, where everything meets at the same time, it's too complicated. You have the Pacific Ocean, the Caribbean Ocean, the Andes Mountains, the desert in the north, the rainforest in the east and the west. So you have so many conditions that you don't know how to deal with them at the same time. Plus, there are other facts that are political facts that are historical. For example, who owns the land? That, that's also a problem that is in most of Latin America. Who owns the land and what they are doing with the land? Is it productive land? Is it a passive land? Um, what, what are the politics or the policies involved in that? That creates different approach to the culture and the way people get together. So then, of course, this this idea of the colony thought, or colonial thought, somehow is not that it still happens. I will say, but when it appeared, it it went into fertile ground because of this the, this connection between geographies the. Um, Oh, yeah, all these situations merge to make a very particular situation that that that, that I don't that, that, I, that the only thing that I will say and taking also a risk with the answer will be that to break that logic it's only through politics for good and for worse. So that homogeneity in the tropics that you say it goes a lot beyond what is climate in the tropics. It's all that you're saying. It's, it's a sum of many situations. The political the economics. Yeah. Yeah, so many situations play at the same time. Exactly. And, and many situations that some of them have not been resolved. Uh, I think that many things of, of Latin American history got interrupted uh, many years ago and are still not solved. Exactly. Something that is different with other countries that 
they ended up the process that we're going through and it, was, it came to an end and a solution. So in Latin America, there are, in Latin America there are many things that have not been solved. For example, who owns the land? That, that's a topic that still haunts the, the political realm in Latin America. We'll have much time to meet us. Okay, maybe, maybe we can connect. Yeah. yeah, my name is Maria Isabel Peña. I'm a Christian scholar. I'm from Venezuela. And I wanted to make a connection with, probably with Venezuela and this uh, orchid garden that you did. Because uh, we could see it as we saw there, the work of uh, Carlos Raúl Villanueva at the World Heritage that we have, that you made, you went from a building to a, a cover square. That's why it's a place for meeting people. And we, we make the connection like very easy because we have this covered roof that is very tall and allows the people to come and gather together. And I think probably that is the success that you turn it from something that was built and closed to something just covered and open. And that's something that just can happen on the tropics also. Yeah. The, the climate provides you with the possibility of being outside all time. Yeah. That's something that here, for example, in New York or in Boston, where we're living now, I mean, being outside on the 4th of February, it's not... I mean, who, who will be outside on the 4th of February when, weather, when the snow is up to here? So understanding exter the, ex the, the idea of exteriority, I think you can provide and feed architecture with different uh, elements that are not necessarily embedded in the history of uh, contemporary or modern architecture. The role of exteriority plays an important role. And I, I, I will say also that the, his, the, the, the main core of the history of architecture is the Mediterranean history, because also climate there played an important role. Yeah, what I wanted to say is that you make something very ordinary in something very historic. Yeah. And that's a good line with which to finish this because indeed Camilo and Juliana and Paulina have brought us a lot of food for inspiration. And I hope we work with that from now on. Thank you. Very Thank you. Much. Thank you very much.